on the court and uh, you know, without hitting a tennis ball. And so a lot of, uh, a lot of you guys have asked me, well, you know, can you detail for us uh, exactly what that 15 or 20 minutes was like? And um, sure, I could do that. And I'm going to do that this morning for you. Obviously not on the tennis court, so I can't demonstrate it for you. But I know that just by describing it, that you will, you'll get a very clear picture of what we did. Uh, every Wednesday morning from 9 until 12, uh, those three hours up in Napa, California on, I think it was the Justin Siena Junior High School courts. Could be wrong with the name. Um, anyway. Uh, so guys, before we get into that, look, um, uh, private one-on-one -on -one coaching, I want to help you. If there is a specific part of your game that you are struggling with and trying to figure it out, could be technique, could be tactic strategy, could be physical, could be mental, right? Could be something else. And uh, if there's some part of your game that you've been working on, just not getting it done, uh, I want the opportunity to help you. And the way that we can do that is through some private one-on-one -on -one coaching, not on the court, but uh, either through Zoom or StreamYard as we're doing here, or we can just get in the phone and chat, whatever you want to do. Um, you can send me a video, short little video of maybe it's a stroke that you're working on. Maybe it's a tactic um, and we'll work through it. And really the key here <laughs> with online coaching, and I almost think it's better sometimes than uh, on court uh, coaching um, is because if there's something that you want to figure out, the first way to do it is to have a video model that you can copy. So you kind of see the whole thing. Let's take the top spin forehand, for example. If you're trying to work on that and there's some part you're just not getting, I mean, or there's some result that's happening that you don't like, maybe it's landing too short, maybe there's too much spin, maybe it's flying deep, whatever it is. The first way to start figuring out is to watch a model that's got the entire thing that you want to copy. Um, and, 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 and then from there, it's really a, a function of, all right, here's the model to copy, but what are the different parts that you've got to have clarity on that actually make up the whole, right? And so I've been reading a lot recently of, uh, Daniel Co uh, Coyles, C-O-Y-L-E, uh, his book, The Talent Code, highly recommended. And, you know, one of the things in there is a, is a term called chunking. And chunking is really finding those parts, right? Finding those parts of, let's say, the top spin forehand, the true fundamentals that make it work so that you are consistent as a shot maker, but that you get confidence when you go out in the court and play a match that you can execute it. Right. And you don't have to manufacture it. You can actually let your subconscious take over and, and perform the technique for you. Um, anyway, that's what I'd love to help you with. So if there's some party game, again, could be forehand, could be backhand, could be volleys, overhead serve, whatever it is, approach shots, Again, maybe it's a tactic. Maybe it's a shot pattern, shots, pattern, shot patterns. <laughs> I'm not sure which one gets the plural. Anyway, you get the idea. Um, we'd love to have that opportunity to help you. So uh, if you've got some interest, shoot me an email, brent at webtennis.com. I'll get back to you, let you know how the program works at price, and then you can decide if this is something that you want to try. Guys, let's talk about uh, the Tom Stowe, the first 15 minutes on the court. And like I said yesterday, today, and I was talking to my good friend, Joel Drucker yesterday, a fellow member of the Berkeley Tennis Club and all world, you know, a 7.0, 7.0 tennis writer. Um, and we were talking about, he actually wrote a great article uh, with his comparisons to uh, the great Don Budge, who won the first Grand Slam, men's Grand Slam in 1938. Uh, and Novak, and kind of the path that uh, that Novak's on and kind of the similarities between that and, and Budge. And as I mentioned yesterday, Mr. Stowe helped Don Budge become a Grand Slam champion. I was sort of lamenting to Joel yesterday, man, is there going to be any, even a tiny minuscule reference to the great Tom Stowe if Novak should you know, achieve the third well, actually, I guess it would be the fourth men's Grand Slam, Budge in 38, 
Laver in both 62 and 69. And, uh, you know, maybe this year with Novak. We shall see in a few hours. Um, but anyway, so I hope he gets his due. I hope Mr. Snow gets his due because he sure made <laughs> – a like major difference in, in my tennis game, not only as a player, but as a coach and also some life lessons that he taught me along the way. Um, guys, let's get into the first 15 minutes in the court. So what I've mentioned to you before is we didn't hit a ball for the first 15, sometimes 20 minutes. We would not hit a tennis ball. And <clears throat> the reason for that is that is that Tom wanted to make sure that, that <laughs> focus number one, um, uh, was was balance and posture that you moved around the court with this exquisite balance and posture, so that when it came to hitting a tennis ball, um, you had that balance and posture so that you could make it repeatable. I mean, that th that was kind of the first thing that he understood about the game was that if you're not on balance, if you don't have great posture, um. First of all, you're improvising stroke technique from one shot to the next, but visually, you don't track a moving tennis ball as well, if at all, if you're off balance. And it was my good friend, Jim McLennan, uh, who actually turned me on to, gosh, a study, I want to say in the late 70s, I think by one of the great pitching coaches, I think his name is Tom House. Um, but <clears throat> they were talking about, they were talking uh, about, about hitters that, that if you get off balance, that the first thing that your eyes want to do is they want to find a stationary object to reorient yourself in space. It might take just a fraction of a nanosecond to do that. But you know what happens is like if you can imagine we're, we're running around the tennis court trying to, trying to retrieve, uh, retrieve a tennis ball. And if you're slightly off balance as you're either running, moving, or if once you get there, you're a hair off balance, well, visually, what are you doing? You are looking for a stationary object somewhere. And that's not the moving tennis ball. So anyway, um, so the first 15 minutes, as I recall, uh, you know, we'd get there a few minutes before nine o'clock. We would take two laps around the outside of the court, light jogging uh, without the tennis racket, windmilling our arms in one direction and then the other direction. However, when we were doing that, we were really focused on whatever direction we were, we were sort of lightly jogging towards. So if I was on one baseline and now I'm gonna lightly jog towards the other baseline uh, going around the net, I would find a spot on that on that far uh, windscreen that I was lightly jogging towards as I'm windmilling my arms, trying to keep my eyes from bouncing up and down as I'm lightly jogging towards that baseline, right? And then we would get to we would get to the baseline, and then there'd be a little side to side, right, where you'd move side to side, and then rather than sort of a windmilling, you kind of do your arms back and forth this way. However, as you were doing that side to side to go to the other side of the, the court is you would find a stationary object over there on that on that far windscreen and you would keep your eyes seeing if you could go side to side without that spot over there moving up and down. I'm telling you, really hard to do. Uh, and so we would do that for two laps. Um, and then. And then the next thing would be he would he would get us on the baseline, all four of us. And there was myself and three other guys. Um, and then we would, again, without the racket and we would stand on the baseline and then we would walk towards the net again, finding our spot um, on the. The big O balance and posture in real time or slowed down to emphasize control or both. Well, we'll see. I mean, um, so, well, let me, let me answer that. Oh, cause I'm, I think I understand it, but so we would, we would walk towards the baseline. I mean, walk towards the net from the baseline, a natural walking motion, no tennis involved, just a natural walking motion with our, with, with, with our vision locked on a spot uh, on that, on that far windscreen and seeing if we could walk and not make that spot 
move up and down. And then we would walk backwards, right? Natural walking, no tennis, nothing. But again, trying to, and then we would get to back to the baseline, still visually locked on that spot. And then we'd start a light jog like we'd done before, but this time, you know, a natural light jog, right? Without windmilling the arms. Again, trying to keep the eyes from bouncing or keeping that spot over there from bouncing up and down. And then we do the same thing, lightly jogging backwards. And when you get out to do this, guys, you got to be really careful. And here's here's the here's the condition I'm putting out there. Um, it's 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 tricky when you're not maybe not so much when you're walking backwards. But once you start jogging backwards, you know, you can trip. You got to be careful. Right. So be aware. And if you're going too quickly and you're feeling slightly off balance as you're going backwards, stop. Right. Get your balance. Walk until you can do it. And then we would. So then we would. Then we would come back to baseline. And then we would do a light sprint towards the net. Right. We'd get to the net, but the whole time trying to keep that object over there, that spot on the you know could be a stain, could be a number on that on that windscreen over there from from bouncing up and down. Sounds pretty simple. It's not. It's tough. The whole idea of this was to learn how to teach your body how to move in such a way that you were like a ballroom dancer. Mr. Still loved the reference of ballroom dancers. Let me get out of the way here. The sun came through. Um, in terms of the way they moved, uh, and 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 he would bring that up all the time. You know, he, he said, Mr. Abel, you'd make a lousy ballroom dancer. Okay, I'll, I'll I'll keep working on that, sir. And but so and and then after that, he would then get us into two rows uh, back in the baseline with our racket. Yeah. So now we go get our racket. We get back there and we would space ourselves so that we could see him. He'd be up at the net and all he would do. And I'm sure you guys have done this before. Um, he would point to the right or point to the left. And what we would do is we had to turn out of our ready position in a certain Jeff Jacklitz calls it the framework. Some of the guys call it the unit turn, but there was the stow turn to prep to get the racket ready so that if the ball was hit to you, right, right, perfectly spatial. All right. You're all set to go. But if not, and the chances are that 99 out of 100 times when a ball's hit to you, you've got to adjust spatially to the path of that incoming ball, either moving over to it or getting out of the way of it. But he would he would point to one direction, wouldn't say anything. And we would we would turn and we would move in that direction, walking right Again, looking forward, looking at him, and but being in the in the racket prep position and moving and walking in such a way that our, our eyes had already been trained that morning, retrained uh, to to move so that we weren't bouncing up and down. And if you could do that, then you know what you had good balance and good posture. And he was the first one to point at one of us and go, "Ah, oh, come on, no, no, you're you're just a hair." He had an eye for it. Right. It's not easy to pick that out, but he had a great eye for it. And then once he would point to the other direction, we would come back and we would sidestep back to the starting position. Right. And then sometimes he would point backwards, which meant that you had to move backwards out of your ready position um, and to sort of create a little space right to the into the imaginary path of a ball coming in. And then he and then he point forward and all that. So, look. You guys get the idea. This is really simple. No, there's no magic to it. Um, but if you train yourself, it's like anything else that we train. When you train it, you become better at it, right? You tell your subconscious, this is the way I want to move on the court. Um, he had another drill too, where um, once we would start hitting and he wouldn't do it you know, in a big rally situation with one guy from one baseline to another, but he would have one of the guys underhand feed me some balls and Mr. Stowe would be behind me and, and he could actually with like a finger, he could get between your shoulder blades. And if you were a hair off balance and he kind of poked you back behind in your shoulder blades, you'd stumble a, a step or two because you were off balance. And then you come back, you get reoriented, you get good posture, good balance. He'd do it again. Nothing. 
and it'd feel like he was kind of using his palm almost, right? So he could tell when you were off balance, a little finger push would get you going and this would not do it. So I don't know how else to emphasize the importance of posture and balance to become a consistent shot maker, right? I mean, it just, you just, I don't know, instinctively in the game, either because we bring some tension to the game, um, whatever it is, we get a little herky jerky out there with our movement. Sometimes uh, we get a little, a little tense in terms of, I want to get rid of the ball. I don't want the tennis ball. I want to get rid of it. You get a little bit too early with contact. You rush it, right? Well, if you are, and I remember the feeling once I got on the court with him where, where I had, I finally had achieved the posture and balance that he was looking for. And he kind of described it was, you know, you're, you're this, not like a statue, but you're this, you're so solid in terms of balance and posture that you're swinging away. You're swinging out away from that posture and balance, but it's not pulling you forward. And I just remember the first couple of times feeling that both forehand and backhand and just going, oh my God, this feels so different. It feels so much better than kind of, you know, having the upper body kind of leaning or lunging forward um, as either I'm moving for the ball or trying to hit the tennis ball. So short of demonstrating that in the court for you, I think you're getting the idea of what I'm talking about. Um, Owen said balance and posture in real time or slow down to emphasize control or both. Yeah. So, I mean, if you, if you'll read the book, everybody, the talent code, what you're going to find in all these different skills. And there's a lot of references in there to tennis, a lot of references in there to music, a lot of references in there to soccer, other different skills. Everything starts very slow. And the reason it starts slow, especially with tennis, is because if you've got an incoming tennis ball in real time, as if you're rallying, your brain is only, only focused on timing. It's only focused on, well, when's this ball going to arrive, right? You're not feeling the different parts. Again, let's, let's use the toss in forehand as an example. You're not focused on the different parts that make up the technique of that simple rally ball, semi-topper, full topper, whatever, forehand ground stroke. You're only thinking about, about timing. At least that's all that your brain is, is, is consumed with. You, you can be thinking about other things, but it's getting overridden by <laughs> Look, Hold on for one second. Let me get this out of my eyes here. And there we go. Um, so, so yes, you start very slow. I remember um, lots of times at the Berkeley Tennis Club, um, when I started really getting as an, God dang it. <laughs> When I started as an adult, um, playing a lot of tennis, right? And that was sort of in my mid-20s. And uh, there was a guy that a lot of you may have heard of, a guy named Jeff Broviak, who was a member uh, of the Berkeley Tennis Club as I was growing up as a kid there. And then he would come back after playing around. You know, I think he got to 20 in the world. I mean, the guy was a phenomenal athlete, uh, incredible musician, um, but a different dude in terms of the way he thought about the game of tennis and maybe some other parts of life as well. But a great guy, just a great guy. I remember watching him. And this is when he's world-class. You know, he's beaten all the guys in the world at some point. And, uh, and he's out there on court five or court six of the BTC. And he's moving around the court very slowly. And he's got balls coming in very slowly. And he's working, he's working the feeling of the stroke extremely slowly. And I just, for, I just never really quite got it um, until really the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years where uh, I've done enough studying, uh, observing, and, and, and just realizing that if you want to master something, if you want to get really good at something, you've got to understand what are the different parts of that thing. And you've got to break them down. And look, the forehand can be broken down into a pretty small number of chunks, right, of different parts. 
But until you until you practice each one of those chunks slowly enough to understand the feeling, number one, but to do it and then do it often enough to where your brain it gets imprinted on your brain. Well, this is this is part number one. Um, it's not going to happen. And I see it way too often. Guys go out there in the warm up and they're just bombing balls from from the start. And I don't get it. I just don't get it. I mean, the big O will tell you, you know, when we go out there, I mean, we start up, we we start with a short court warm up. And for me, that's a hyper active time in terms of the feet, trying to create space to every one of his slow balls coming in, right? And I'm not thinking about topping and this, I'm just trying to create space. I'm trying to get into that stow, into that stow first 15 minutes. Do I have good posture? Do I have good balance? Am I creating space with my feet? Um, and, and as the ball comes in, am I tapping it at the exact point of contact that's right for me on my forehand or my backhand? And, you know, am I not peaking? Am I making sure? I mean, all those fundamentals for me that maybe not for you, but for me that I need to repeat every single time I go out there and play. So um, I don't know what else to tell you, man. We're at 22 minutes, blah, blah, blah. I could talk about this stuff forever. Uh, it, it, it really, it would be the repeat. <laughs> It'd be the same thing over and over. Um, you know, I've been thinking a lot lately and I actually talked to Maya this morning and I said, you know, I'm a little concerned. I'm a little concerned with this online teaching stuff that there's very, very few people that are willing to go out there and put in this kind of work if they honest to God want to get better at some part of their game. And, you know, as opposed to, I think there are a lot of people who watch seven around seven or some of my stuff in my courses, more just for entertainment, you know, not, not really that they're in a, okay, great. Maybe that's kind of a valid, you know, maybe for some it's a, you know, it's a validation of them that, well, I'm working on this one thing. Okay. You know, Brent says this is what's worked for him. All right. Well then I'm going to keep working on that. That's fine. But in terms of the reality of becoming better at a certain part of your game and overall becoming better, I'm not saying it's drudgery. I'm not saying that you got to work like a dog and this and that. But I am saying that you got to get you got to get smart about how you figure stuff out, how you practice. And man, there's no light switch. And I know in this day and age where you can go on Google and believe me, I've been doing that lately with you know a couple of projects I got going down on our property here. A couple of things, I, I just go to Google, right? Boom, it's right there. I got to figure it figured out, right? But with this, with a game of tennis, you could you could you can Google anything, any part of the game you want. You'll get a thousand different results. Uh, and then the challenge comes in. All right, well, which one of those results um, are you actually going to use as th the epiphany that, that that starts the process? And I hate you know I I just I I, I don't like to use the word hate, but but it discourages me to see so many players out there going, Brent, what's the formula? What, what can I do? You're my Google, Brent. Uh, you know, give me, give me the answer here. I got, okay, here's 27 bucks for the course. And they're looking for, they're looking for that quote unquote quick fix. So I guess that's one of the things that I got from Mr. Stowe with, with the first 15 minutes on the court with him is that, this was a deeper learning process than just him feeding me a few balls for 30 minutes and going, well, here's what to do. And, you know, see you later. Uh, even if it was once a week for 30 minutes, right. It was, it was a three hour session. Um, and it, it was, I'd never experienced that before ever. Right. Where I'd actually sort of gone to someone given myself up to him and just assumed well, this guy's got some major street cred, uh, not only as a player. I mean, the guy won the NCAA doubles, played for Cal Berkeley, 
slightly back in the day. Um, and then he goes on to coach Budge to a grand slam. So the street cred was there. And Budge wasn't like a one shot deal for him. He had all kinds of different men and women that he coached to become world class tennis players. So when I went to him, I kind of had this big sigh of relief like, man, this is it. All I have to do is, is do exactly what he says. And, and when, I, when I first went up there, I didn't know how long it was going to take. I didn't really know what was in store for me. But what I finally came away from after that first three-hour session was that I'm in the right place. I'm in this for the long haul. And, and whatever, whatever he tells me to do, I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to do it. I could sit there and question everything, right? The whole, the whole thing about, well, you know, question everything, blah, blah, blah. Okay. But for me, I didn't do that. I just, I just, and, and look, I had, I had the luxury of these three other guys who were top five in NorCal in the men's open. So I had, I had models that I could copy. I had three of them that I could copy right then and there. And, you know, those two guys, those three guys could be on, or maybe two of them would be on, you know, the court next to us. And Tom would be talking to me about something and, and he would just turn and he would point to one of the guys, either the Kinger or Steve or Hubs and just say, there it is. Watch that. And I'd watch it and go, and he'd go, just, just, just copy that. And so I had that luxury. And I really believe that part of any part of the game that you want to get better at, you need to have a model to copy. Um, if you don't have a teaching pro that can show you exactly, exactly what is, what is, what is the stroke technique that is so fundamental, that is so basic that anybody could copy it. Then I don't know, man, that's, that's, that's rough. I mean, the great Tim Galway, right? He, he finally got in this thing where he decided, you know what, I'm going to teach, but I'm not going to say a word. I'm just going to demonstrate. And, you know, lo and behold, he had, he had players, he had total, you know, 50 year old people coming out there, never hit a tennis ball in their life. And within 20, 30 minutes without saying a word and just modeling him, they could actually hit the tennis ball decently enough to have some fun. So um, the big O, becoming better takes focus, repetition, and most importantly, time. Results are not expected. They just happen after investing in those things for me. Yeah. And, and look, um, you know, there's, there's, a level, there's a level of frustration that I have with Mr. Stowe in the beginning that um, – wasn't his fault. It was my fault because I I just wanted this thing so fast. I didn't understand. Like, oh, it's, it's you know the big thing is time. You never know when when it's going to actually show up. When when that that topspin forehand rally ball that you hit ten in a row just cleaner than a whistle. You never know when that skill is actually going to show up. There's there's no specific timeline for it. Right. Everyone's slightly different in terms of, you know, for me, I mean, decent athlete. Um, I played a lot of baseball. Um, I already came there with, you know, a decent amount of posture and balance, but it got a whole lot better with Mr. Stowe. But I wanted the thing so bad. I wanted it too quickly. And that really slowed me down in terms of when I finally got it. And so he, he really he taught me that, you know, the more you get frustrated with this, um, the slower it's going to take. So you just, at some point, you have to trust that if you, you have the right model to copy and you've got the right person to break down that model in terms of the different parts, the different chunks, so that you have clarity on how to perform each one of those chunks slowly in the beginning, if you if if you trust that you've got that and you and you're putting in the time, it's inevitable. How can you not get better if you've got those 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 pieces? I don't know. I don't know. So anyway, guys, big time ramble today.
Um, thanks for hanging in with me. We've gone past 30 minutes. We've gone way past the seven around seven thing. Well, we did the around seven part, but the seven first part, not, not so much. All right, guys. Look, um, yeah, if you want some private one on one coaching, um, would love to uh, would love to give it a shot with you. And, um, you know, I'm going to give you if there's some specific technique that you're working on, I'm going to give you a model to copy. Uh, I'm going to break that model down for you so you clearly understand what it is. What are the different parts? We call them fundamentals. You can call them whatever you want. Um, and you've heard my story before when I got frustrated with Mr. Stowe and I been with him for you know a couple of months. We've been doing the same thing over and over and over again. I said, okay, uh, Tom, um, okay, we've been doing this for quite a while. When do we get to the advanced stuff? Oh boy. That was like, uh, maybe one of the dumbest things I've ever said to anybody. He kind of looked at the gate and I know he was this far from telling me, get your stuff, go through the gate and don't ever come back. And all he said was, when you master these fundamentals, that will be the advanced stuff. So um, I'm not sure how I got off topic on that, but anyway, fundamentals, chunks, parts, whatever it is, you got to have clarity uh, of what those are. And, and you need a model to copy from to be able to do that. So uh, if you want some help, hit me up, brent at webtennis.com. I will get back to you with how we work, uh, what the price is, and then you can decide if that might be a good fit for your game. Guys, that's it for me today. I got a nice practice session this morning coming up soon. And then uh, going down for some cross training down at our property. Lots of cleaning, lots of sawing lots of you know take that anyway uh it's time we got to get out there help someone else have a spectacular day guys i'll see you again tomorrow